All right. Hey, thanks for joining me here. I think there's a sexier presentation down the street here, so. <laughs> okay. Hey, how are you? Um, my name is David Burks. I work for Seagate Technology, and um, I've got a really cerebral, esoteric, boring presentation for you today. It's about bit error correction on hard drives. So because this is you know, such a techie subject and the people that come here are a little bit different, I want to just do a warning here. So, you know, we've got a lot of people of high intelligence in here. It's just the nature of the business, right? So, but, so uh, you've also got people that tend to be, this thing is not working great, detail-oriented, right? All, the, all of us hardware engineers and coders and stuff are detail-oriented. So, and then, unfortunately, that, sometimes that goes with the socially inept. I'm not going to say anything or point anybody out here, but we have that going. And then, Unfortunately, that's sometimes some of us in here, maybe me included, are maybe a little emotional unstable. So we've got an audience here that obviously is going to have some geeks. I see a few of you in here. So thank you, geeks, for coming. Also, some of the dorks are here, right? And, and then we combine that with a few geeks and some of the spazzes. So with that warning, I'll dive into here. But you know, like they say in uh, security these days, if you see something, say something, right? So we're all among friends. <laughs> Okay, so there's my little bit uh, fun part of this. So I want to dive in, and this will be a little fun too, but just looking at a, a short history of error correction in the hard drive industry. So let's go back in time a little bit, starting at the 50s to the first hard drive, right? The, uh, the IBM RMAC 305 and being delivered on the first FedEx delivery into San Jose, I'm sure, or Silic, probably back in Palo Alto maybe. It's too early for that too. But anyway, this is the area of error correction where I say, what's error correction, right? <laughs> These, the first, first hard drive ever, there really wasn't a whole lot in the way of error correction on this. And I, I always like to think about this in the context of one of my old time friends at Seagate just retired after many, many years in the industry. And he used to regale me with stories about how, you know, gosh, the first drives we'd, we'd sell, we would be, you know, there'd be guys in the factory putting these together, smoke and ashes falling into the head stack, and they'd have to brush, you know, cigarette butts out of the boxes that they'd ship, <laughs> ship them in and stuff. It was in a different day. So these guys, literally, he said, you know what our reliability spec was on a drive back then? It was that 70% of the drives that they'd take to the customer and turn on would actually spin up. They'd actually run. So I think we've come a long way from that, obviously. So. We'll kind of supercharge and go forward another 10 years. We'll look into the 60s at the IBM 1311. And here, you know, things have gotten a lot smaller, so now we've got, you know, a large washing machine size drive here. But not a whole lot further in terms of error correction because this is the area of be really, really careful with it. You know, that's their advice. Actually, I looked in the manual and, and this says precaution should be exercised to prevent foreign particles from entering the 1311 disk stack. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, this is before clean rooms and things like that were all in vogue. So you have to be careful. You don't want to use things like brooms and dust cloths and things like that that could actually contaminate. So you got to be really careful. Going forward another 10 years, we're making some progress here. And here we actually have some error correction. It wasn't spec, but IBM 3340. So I read through the manual on this, which was kind of fun. And this is the error correction error that I call, will tell you what might work if you do get an error, right? So this is actually out of the manual. This is step eight. So you can see I selected something down. The, there's probably about 12 pages of how to handle error corrections. It says perform the error correction function. So the error correction function is first manual. You got to go, you know, you're not getting a read, so you got to go perform it. Then you have to examine bit seven of the mask. And if this doesn't work, go to step C, right? So at step C, this is the first retry. You had an actual retry and error correction. It was a manual retry. You had to read the mask and go to step C. And they could do all this stuff. So, you know, clearly uh, a lot of room for opportunity back in the 70s. So keep going back in, or forward in time here to the 80s. And I just used this one. Here's the first Seagate drive that I could find, the ST506. And error correction capabilities on that were actually published. So we had our first published error correction. And it was like a quantum leap going from, we'll tell you how to fix it and we'll, you know, give you all these steps to 10 to the minus 12th error correction. So, and you know, for again, those of you detail oriented geeks out there, if I got some of this wrong, I apologize, but this was my brief history lesson here. But so we're getting into the era of error correction here. 
Moving forward another 10 years into the 90s, got another example here. It's still five and a quarter inch drive, the 4051. And now we've got another order of, actually two orders of magnitude better. So from 10 to the minus 12th to 10 to the minus 14th. And then moving into the 20th century, which is where we're at today, we've made another two orders of magnitude correction of the best drives out there. I don't think anything's better than 10 to the minus 16th that I know of. That's our kind of mission critical drives. Near line drives are still spec'd at 10 to the minus 16th or 15th. So that's where we're at today. And it sort of begs the question about, is that good enough? And actually maybe it's too good, right? Because what we want to do here is look at this in the era of cloud computing because lots of things have changed, right? And if some of you participated uh, down the road a little bit here with uh, a group of some of the cloud service providers talking about launching a, a new process with an OCP to kind of talk about how to improve hard drives, this is one of the things they're interested in, in finding out because they were talking about latencies and, and can you, you know, can we do a read fast or a fail early type of thing? And that's directly related to our error correction because error correction can take time. It's, it's got a range of time, but there's an opportunity there. So if we were to ask what is a cloud HDD, right? Today it doesn't exist. We have general purpose HDDs. More and more of them are shipping into the cloud, but generally speaking, we're still living with this, you know, 50 plus year legacy of stuff that we designed for traditional storage that evolved into enterprise storage that was still very much based on depending on the hard drive to fix errors. So now we've got this stuff. We've got replication in data centers. We've got advanced erasure coding. And that stuff can compensate for a lot of ugliness in a hard drive if it doesn't do the same thing. So now this is the area where we just start to reevaluate this a little bit. So this picture here gives you some sort of a sense of what our UER, our bit error rate, could be and how that relates to latency. I didn't, this doesn't have a lot of numbers on it and stuff, so it's obviously just, a, just kind of a, a relationship type of thing. But higher latency does correlate with, with better bit error rates, right? So when, when, a, when a hard drive is reading, you know, and we take one spin, that's one latency and stuff, that's probably your best case error correction. If you, if you get an error, let the disk spin around, try to read it again. And then we go, you know, then we'll maybe do more spins. And then we're doing different types of error correction that take a little bit more time, a little bit more processing power, and more and more and more until, you know, sometimes you'll have an, an error that takes all of what we got to correct out to the 10 to the minus 16th. And that's going to potentially take some time. Well, a lot of the CSPs with these service level agreements that they've got at this cluster level, are going, we can't afford that. We don't like those tail latencies. We need to tighten that up a little bit. So, and it's interesting though, because sometimes we'll get comments from customers that'll say, hey, we want, we want lower latencies and tighter distribution there. And we say, okay, well, we can do that. And, uh, and, and other CSPs say, you know what we'd like is, we'd like you to turn that way down. We'd like you to harvest that into more capacity and you know, higher reliability, more capacity, and lower costs, and so on. Sometimes those are at different odds. So part of the problem here is just getting consistent feedback from customers that we can narrow into one kind of new requirement and actually build a new widget for them that would store a lot of data. So let's go back to the future a little bit. <laughs> Don't even need a flux capacitor. We're just gonna go back to 1980, and we're gonna look at what we might be able to achieve. So here's what we could do in the near term. And these guys in the next room, we're, we're talking about this in a large respect because um, a slide that I recently saw down the street here was that you know sometimes we get maybe a latency of like 500 milliseconds. Well, today there's codes within T10 and T13 that you can put into place with your drives that you can basically set like that maximum time to, I think it's about 100 milliseconds. So there's some opportunity on the table right now that's basically free, just utilizing some of the stuff that's in the spec right now in the firmware. Um, it's not actually that common that we actually see that used, but what that could do right away is, is get better command completion times, average com command completion times, which means there is, there is some tail latency improvement on the table right now with existing technology. Now, if we want to take that to a, to a higher order level or a more advanced level and a more organized level, 
then that's where there's some process involved, where we all kind of, kind of talk about what the common need is, talk about maybe some options in that spec that could, that could be implemented to say, I want that to fast fail. I want it to fast fail in a condition. Maybe I want to automatically turn my error correction all the way down to 10 to the minus 10th. And then if I get an error, maybe I can optionally go turn it back up and do things like that. So there's a lot of different things that we could do, but we really depend on the industry to tell us what we need to do in a way that we can kind of get economies of scale and so on. So the other thing that's possible here is in the long term, if we take some of these things down into the bowels of our manufacturing process, we could even harvest more. We could get potentially improved yields. We could get potentially better time to market at new capacity points because we're not testing to such a you know, intense level of error correction and so on. And ultimately that boils down to reduce cost, manufacturing costs, and lower dollar per terabyte for our, cons our customers. But it's a chicken and egg thing, and I've kind of been alluding to this, right? So we have error correction rates baked into a lot of what we do, all the way to head media and uh, head and media manufacturing assumptions. That's baked into our ASIC design, because a lot of complex mathematics goes into a lot of these error correction routines, and we need to make sure that we have the hardware in there to complement those. Our servo mechanical capabilities, so you know, tracking and being able to read reliably without track-to-track -track interf interference and so on, all that's baked into our drives. And about obviously, ultimately codified within the code that we write in our firmware to make it real. And then our test processes. A lot of our limits in the test process have these same basic assumptions to say, hey, 10 to the minus 15th or 16th or whatever it is, is, is what our pass-fail criteria is. So, you know, that has to change as well. So while, you know, we understand that customers want to ask for different things, you know, they need to realize that there's a lot of variables involved here and a lot of connectedness to all this. So, this opportunity really de de demands some collaboration. So I'm actually kind of thrilled that this particular forum here overlaps with a forum that was on the software track where um, some representatives from Google and Microsoft and Facebook were all in a room talking about you know, the opportunity to maybe introduce a new process within OCP to try to fast track and get agreement on the, within the cloud community of what might they like to have in hard drives that is not there today and that needs some agreement. So one of the things I'd like to accomplish here today is just let you know that that conversation is happening and let you know that that new group is forming up in OCP. And if anybody here wants to be part of that and have a voice in that process, then I think there might be a new, op a new forum uh, to participate in. It's OCP, it's an open group, so there's, there's uh, definitely those opportunities. So, and, and I think I'm doing really good on time here, but um, so the key questions are pursu to pursue here is what is that sweet spot and, and what are the, you know, the nuances of that and how best could that be codified and so on? How's that going to be determined? And then can this OCP group be used to organize, standardize, and operationalize these efforts? And with that, I'll go to the obligatory questions, comments, or your ridicule because I butchered the topic. Questions? Yeah. So the I'm going to pass it So if you go to T and stuff, let's say as a cloud service provider. If you look at what? As a cloud service provider, if you can control when the firmware returns error, or as in you set Could you latency, put that a little closer to your mouth? Like if you can set the latency for the commands and stuff, you're already manipulating the UER for the drive. Right. Well, sir, yes, you are, right. If you can, if you manipulate the latencies, right. that means by definition you're not, you're going to rule out certain error correction that would give you the UAR. So you have to accommodate that. Yes, at in, a higher level of software, yes, Correct. by replication or whatever. Right. But um, where I see benefit here is if you could come to the cloud service providers and say, if you actually officially reduce your UER, then this is the new capacity gain that you get, right? I can see them taking the bait on that. Yes, so for example, if we got good agreement. Now, one of the proposals, if, if some of you are familiar with the Google white paper that Lawrence Lim uh, wrote, uh, one of the things I think that was represented in there was that, you know, hey, we'd like to turn down this error correction. 
but then leave it in there so that we could go after it later. Right. Well, then that limits any opportunity that might exist or associated with better cost on your drives, better, faster time to market on higher capacities and so on. So, so there's that trade-off. Uh, my question was more like, do you have guidance on what you think your newer capacity point reach rate would accelerate by if you bumped down the UER or bumped it down? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even venture to guess that right now. There's so many things that, f that go into aerial densities, and uh, a lot of that is actually getting you know, incrementally harder because we're sque squeezing tracks so close together. It's clear that there's some opportunity on the table, but to express it in a percentage or something like that would be a, just a wild guess. Is there any correlation between UER and lifetime of the drive? You know, does driving UER down ultimately cause a shorter lifetime, which drives a higher cost in the hyperscalers around maintenance and replacement? Not really. I mean, uh, so the error correction would typically be the error correction. I guess would would it, another way to phrase that be: Is it potential that the error rate of a drive could go up over time with use? Well, I think it would be a, it would be detected. The, so the question would be: Would would there be? Is there the potential for increasing errors over time? And the answer to that is, in certain circumstances, yes. And as a drive ages, at certain points, you'll definitely get some increase uh, read errors or write errors. And so, but then the question is: Is is the is the error rate or is the error correction schemes within the drive? good enough to still compensate for those. But given that you would, you would probably in, encounter more errors over time, uh, you know, that's pretty much a, a common thing with any of the storage technologies, hard drives and SSD both. You know, you'll get grown defects over time. Any other questions? No? All right, thank you very much. All right, gave you a little bit of time back. Thanks for attending. <laughs>